Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Miscellaneous Gab, and on this channel, I tell stories about stories. Today's story is revisiting the original Hunger Games trilogy. I'm going to be going through my very much requested video comparing the original Hunger Games to the movies. I'm sure I won't get into all the differences, but I'm going to cover what I believe are the most important ones. So if you think of something that I didn't say, go ahead and pop it in the comments so that we can all learn together. So if that's up your alley, make sure you keep watching, like this video, and subscribe and let's get into it. Despite what anybody says, I love the Hunger Games movies. I think they're relatively well done, relatively well cast. In terms of the Hunger Games compared to kind of what was going on at the time, i.e. Twilight, i.e. Divergent, first and foremost, I want to just say that the first big difference between the Hunger Games books and the Hunger Games movies is hunger. Where is the hunger? Pass the marmalade. In the books, hunger is way more of a thing. Katniss grew up absolutely starving. She knows hunger very well. She has always been very malnourished, underfed, very skinny. She has passed out, almost passed out from starvation, been on the literal brink of death. The one thing that the movies really didn't touch on too much is the tessery. Now, the tessery is a way for District 12 children to put their names in more times into the Hunger Games reaping as a way of either getting oil rations or food rations. This is why at the beginning of the movie, when Katniss asked, scale how many times his name has been entered and he's like a lot we know that it is because he was forced to take the tessery in order to feed himself and his family hunger is the impetus for so many things in the book including katniss's and Peta's dynamic the beginning of their relationship was founded on hunger on the way he was able to save her from that hunger give her a temporary release from that hunger when katniss actually gets to the capital she is exposed to more food than she's ever experienced in her entire life she gorges herself the other most crucial difference between the books and the movies is Katniss's perspective. Katniss is a very damaged character. So much of her struggle is internal. In the books, we get a first person limited present tense narration style, which means that the entire book is happening in real time from Katniss's perspective. This adds a layer of depth and nuance to the character that we just don't see behind J-Law's very well acted rendition of Katniss. She definitely plays into the archery girl boss stoic moody side of Katniss which I think is Katniss's main side. But what her perspective allows us to see is that there's more to it than that. And there's reasons why she is like that. Because we don't get access to Katniss's internal life and thoughts, we miss very crucial things. So for example, we miss her relationship with her father. We miss how much that means to her. When Katniss's father died, she essentially lost two parents. Her father was physically no longer in her life. He was no longer able to be a provider and protector for their family. At the same time, because of the emotional burden that that caused, Katniss's mother became depressed and pretty much emotionally withdrew from their family. This left the burden of caring for their family up to a very young Katniss. It shows why she is damaged and cold, why she has her guard up. She was forced to grow up way too fast. We lack Katniss's perspective. We lack just how traumatized she is, how much PTSD she has well before she ever enters the arena. The only reason why Katniss wants to stay alive in the first Hunger Games is to protect Prim. She has never done much for herself. She has always acted out of her desire to care for and save the people she loves. Past book and movie one, something that the movies don't get super into, is Katniss does not want to be alive. She is a hundred percent okay with being the one to become unalive so that Peta can live. The next key difference is that Katniss doesn't win. The last book in the trilogy is really sad. Even though Katniss has a happy ending in the sense that she and Peta end up together and they have children, it's clear that she doesn't win. Even though she is the symbol for this rebellion, for the ending of the Hunger Games, she is ultimately the one who loses. And it just goes to show that no one really wins. Final scene in the Mockingjay movie makes it seem like she is the ultimate hero and kind of wins the ultimate freedom. In the books, she is actually horribly burned, disfigured, and a waiting trial for murdering President Coin. She has lost mostly everything that she cares about, so I understand why they did make that change. One of the only benefits we have from obviously the movie being unable to take Katniss's perspective is we get to see how the rest of the country is reacting to the Hunger Games. We get to see what's going on between Snow and the game makers. Going off 
off of that, there is a big theme of trauma that we don't see that much in the films. The trauma of the first Hunger Games, death and destruction after the games when they have to go on tour and see that these districts are starting to revolt. People are getting killed because of that and it's really all in her name. The second Hunger Games is obviously horribly traumatic for her. She has already been suffering from terrible PTSD and nightmares and lose the only person that she's really ever loved by choice, which is Peta, who becomes weaponized against her and used as a way to subvert her psychologically and damage her physically. She is unwillingly made the center of a rebellion, a figurehead of a movement where she no longer really even gets to be a person. During the Mockingjay era she goes on tour once again and sees terrible things happen all in her name this is trauma for life we also miss out on Hamish's trauma so i'll get to Hamish as a character in a moment here but Hamish is also horribly traumatized because of the things that he not only went through during his own hunger games which was 23 years in the past but is actively still suffering from we also miss out on a bit of phoenix trauma and the sa that he endured during his time as a tribute and post winning even the winners are treated horribly this just goes to show that nobody ever really wins the hunger games key difference number i don't know is katniss and Peta's dynamic. We definitely get a different view of their dynamic in the books because of Katniss's perspective and some of it is just the way the characters are portrayed and written. Katniss almost immediately starts seeing Peta as an obstacle to her own survival. In the books, when he confesses that he has a crush on her on live TV, he made me look weak. He made you look desirable. She obviously gets angry in both the books and the movies, but in the books, she actually pushes him into a vase that shatters and cuts his hand. This more escalated violence and permanent harm that she causes Peta shows just how much she misinterprets his actions. Because of her own trauma, she is simply waiting for him to try and kill her. She is very unable to accept that he actually loves her, which is why she sees their dynamic as way more of a game. It's also important to understand about where Katniss and Peta come from and about District 12 in itself. Within District 12, there is actually a class and almost racial divide within even the poorest district in Pan Am. There is this line between the merchants and the seam. The seam is where the poorest of the poor come from. Those are the people working in the mines, starvation riddled children. They are the people who are really scraping together to make ends meet. You also have the merchants. This is where Peta's family comes from. Peta's family are bakers and just by virtue of that, he has grown up with more food and more nourishment than Katniss and the people in the seam. The people in the seam are way more likely to have to take the tessery, so they are way more likely to be entered into the Hunger Games. There is a bit of a aesthetic appearance between the seam and the merchant side, and this wasn't very well represented in the movies because Jennifer Lawrence, while she does have dark hair, she is a very light-skinned, light-eyed actress. The seam residents tend to be olive skin, darker complexion, while the merchants tend to have that light hair and blue eyes. Now, Katniss's father looks like her. Katniss is supposed to have that olive skin and darker complexion, whereas her mother originally came from a merchant family but fell in love with Katniss's father, and therefore you have Prim looking more like the mother, Katniss looking more like the father. That iconic bread scene is very important to Katniss and Peta's dynamic. In the movie, I was actually very confused by the way they represented the scene, having not read the book. I thought that in this scene, Peta was actually being quite horrible to Katniss by throwing bread at her and throwing bread at the pigs. I thought she hated him for this because he was treating her like some sort of animal and there was this power dynamic going on between them. In the books, the scene takes place much younger, so they are much younger kids. I believe they're about 11 or 13, but it's way more clear that Peta feeds Katniss, who is literally on the brink of starvation, even though it means getting beaten by his very abusive and terrible mother. He actually shows up to school with a bruise on his face, so Katniss knows that he went out of his way to feed her and basically save her life. In the books, 
Katniss always refers to Peeta as the boy with the breads. Going off of Peeta and Katniss's dynamic is also the character of Peeta. So I believe he was portrayed as way more weak in the movies. It's really Katniss's story. It's really Archery Girl Boss. It's her time to shine. Peeta is actually much more skilled than Katniss in certain ways. His ability to charm and maneuver socially is unparalleled. He is actually way more like Lucy Gray Baird in the sense that he, maybe he lacked fighting and tactical abilities, but he is extremely charming and likable. Peeta also has older brothers in the books who do not volunteer as tribute when Peeta's name is chosen at the reaping. Additionally, Peeta's mother was awful and even says to him, now they can finally have a champion from District 12. She's not talking about Peta. Peta goes on to lose his entire family when District 12 is destroyed by the Capitol after catching fire. This is very important for Peta's character because it is even more admirable that he is able to be so loving and self-sacrificial to Katniss. It just goes to show that everybody has their own trauma. Even though Peta may have grown up with more food and money than let's say Katniss, Prim, and Gail, he is not without his hardship. This is a favorite. This is a fan favorite to point out is the symbolism of the actual Mockingjay pin. So in the movies, Katniss picks up this pin at the hob, at the trading post. In the books, it's way more symbolic and world building. It has its roots way back into Haymitch's Hunger Games as well and really helps tell the story. In the books, it is given to Katniss by Madge, who is the mayor's daughter. Now, if we think of mayor's daughters, we might think of a ballad of songbirds and snakes where the mayor's daughter is actually responsible for getting Lucy Gray Baird reaped into the Hunger Games. Katniss also thought that Madge hated her as well, but clearly Madge is giving Katniss this Mockingjay pin, a symbol of subversion, because Mockingjays themselves are symbols of subversion. They're almost funny because as we all know, the capital sent Jabberjays into the districts during the rebellion to go spy on the rebels. Now the rebels figured out their plan and sent back the Jabberjays with false information. Once the Jabberjay program was discontinued, Jabberjay started mating with the local Mockingjays, becoming their own mutated proprietary thing of District 12. This shows that the depth of the Brewing Rebellion has been oncoming for years and Katniss is just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Madge giving Katniss the pin almost speaks to Katniss's destiny in a way and the fact that she really doesn't have control over her own fate. It also shows that people see her as the Mockingjay long before she can see herself as it. There is rebellion in the districts way before Katniss can even hear or know about it in in Catching Fire, she runs into two runaways who talk about rebellion and issues in the districts, obviously in the movie, because we get to see the perspective, we know it's happening. The next very important thing to tackle that I know a lot of people love to talk about, and it's important, are the physical injuries. In the books, Peeta loses his leg in the first Hunger Games. The leg injury is much more severe than it is shown in the movies. Peeta has to get his leg amputated in the books, and he actually lives out the rest of his days, including the second Hunger Games, with a prosthetic metal leg. This is a very big deal because in the last scene, right before Katniss and Peeta win the first Hunger Games, she has her last arrow used as a tourniquet to stop the bleeding in Peeta's leg. She ultimately has to take that arrow out of his leg to give Kato a mercy killing and to let them end the Hunger Games a bit more swiftly. This may have been the reason why he ultimately had to get his leg amputated, but it certainly is quite sad and tragic. Additionally, Katniss loses her hearing in one of her years after the explosion at the cornucopia. In the final book, Katniss is horribly injured during the parachute scene. Half of her hair is missing. She has insane burns. She is horribly depressed awaiting her trial. And then we also have the Avoxes, which are only briefly referenced when you meet Katniss's film crew in The Mockingjay. Avoxes are normally taken as political prisoners. Their tongues are cut out, which is a horrible, horrible disfiguration that you can give somebody. And it just goes to show the physical 
political representation of the damage suffered by either the Capitol or the Hunger Games. These people can never be whole again, both physically, mentally, and emotionally. This is part of the reason why I think Katniss is so depressed for most of the Hunger Games, because once you go into the Hunger Games, you do not come back whole. This change really did a disservice to the potential meaning that these characters could have had. Next, let's talk about Haymitch. I love the character Haymitch. I love him both in the books and in the movies. I think he's wonderful. I love Woody Harrelson and I think he was the perfect casting choice for Haymitch. In the movies, Haymitch is a lot more of a fun uncle. It definitely shows his alcoholism. Always there with a funny quip. He's just kind of always there, never taking things too seriously. And that makes him almost a comedic relief on the screen. In the books, he is way more of a damaged, traumatized individual. During the first reaping, he actually comes on stage and falls off the stage. Their mentor cannot even be coherent enough to stand on stage. It also shows the extent of his damage. We actually get way more of a background look into Haymitch's Hunger Games and why he is so messed up. Haymitch won the Hunger Games 23 years ago and you learn that part of the reason why Haymitch won is because he figured out that they were using a force field. He used that force field as a way to kill one of his final, if not his final opponents. He threw an axe over the cliff where he knew there was a force field. It came back up and you know, did the thing, did the deed. The Capitol was actually so angry at Haymitch that they killed his loved ones. Katniss and Peta are not the first ones to have committed what is seen as an act of rebellion in their Hunger Games and through their own winning of their Hunger Games. So not only did Haymitch have to win the Hunger Games, do these horrible things to win the Hunger Games, but he lost the people he cared about. And then he had to spend the next two decades basically watching a new duo of children being slaughtered every year. Obviously, that's a lot more heavy. I know why they maybe wanted to change it, but still, I do want to mention the ending of movie one, ending of The Hunger Games one. When they're at the cornucopia, you see these mutts come. They're scary dogs, essentially. You know they're genetically modified mutant dogs. You know you do not want to come toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. There is so much mutation going on, whether it's physical disablement of children, of the animals that they weaponize, or even just the people of Penn M. Kind of losing their humanity, their morals and ethics through some of the ways that they disfigure themselves electively, either through plastic surgery, covering their skin, etc. In the first book, when Katniss is facing the mutts, she notices something very strange about them. She sees the eyes of the tributes in the mutts. She also sees that each mutt is colored similarly to the color, whether it's the hair color or the skin color of the dead tribute so far, and that they are wearing collars with the district number of the fallen tributes. Obviously, this absolutely terrifies Katniss because not only are these crazy, angry, rabid dogs, but they literally look like they've been created with the eyes and bodies of the dead tributes, which is so messed up. As a truth or as a psychological subversion, we see that Kato's death in the books is way more disturbing and drawn out. He essentially is getting eaten and gnawed and maimed to death throughout the night. So Katniss and Peeta are at the top of the cornucopia. All night they hear Kato's whimpering, his screaming, him calling out for his mother. It's horrible. At the same time, because Kato has not ceased to exist, Katniss and Peeta are sitting atop the cornucopia. Peeta is basically bleeding out from his leg. He is barely holding on for dear life. They are both almost on the verge of dying of hypothermia. Like I said earlier, Katniss had one arrow left and she ultimately used that arrow to deal the final fatal blow to Kato, causing her to take it out as it was Peta's tourniquet, which probably ultimately helped result in his leg amputation. Another change that I actually enjoyed in the movie is Seneca Crane. So Seneca Crane does not occupy as important of a role in the books. He is just the game maker because we don't get those one-on-ones with Snow and Crane kind of learning about the world, learning about the, how the game is played, learning about what a threat Katniss actually is to this world. We don't really see all of that. We don't see his bomb facial hair, his smooth persona, and his ultimate demise being forced to eat the poison berries himself, which I think is just absolute gangster move on President Snow's part. He's evil, but he's got dial. All we know is that obviously Seneca Crane died because of his mistakes in the original Hunger Games, but we don't get any of that additional juicy detail. 
I want to also talk about the Gale and Peta foil. In my opinion, the movie really played up the love triangle aspect way more. In the books, I actually don't think it ever could have been Gale. Peta loves Katniss no matter how many times she rebuffs him, no matter how many times she isn't ready for their love. Gale is a lot more like Katniss. He grew up under similar circumstances like Katniss's. They both lost a parent in the mining accident. They're both from the scene. They both have to hunt to survive to take care of their younger siblings. Gale seems to turn away from Katniss when she does not show him the same love and it seems like he is way more vengeful. He is way more of a rebel. Peta and Katniss ultimately want to see as few people die as possible. Even Katniss talks about the things that Gale had said about the Capitol. He has always been very outspoken about the Capitol. Ultimately, Katniss needs a gentle soul like Peta. Gale is a perfect example of how hurt people hurt people. I think Gail and Katniss are more similar. Katniss ends up being exposed to other characters who help her come out of her shell. She has father figures in Cinna and Haymitch. She has her prep team as well. She has Peta's love, her undying love for Prim. Gail is a lot more hardened and harsh. His goal is ultimately to destroy the capital as much as possible. Next, let's talk about District 13. District 13 is obviously the nuclear power and the original district to rebel. They never went away. They went underground. In the books, actually, Katniss figures out that District 13 is still alive before she goes to District 13. It becomes clear that the capital knows that District 13 is there as well, but they've kind of just established this truce of, we will let you stay underground as long as you never become a problem. The Capitol continues to air the same footage of the smoldering radiation riddled District 13 that they have for years and decades, even though they know that District 13 is still there. District 13 has been able to survive in a very much like a silo style if you've seen the Apple TV show Silo. Very good. I highly recommend if you haven't. It's way more harsh than it's portrayed in the movies. It is a harsh place and it makes you wonder right away if it is a actually good alternative for the future and the Capitol. They have to be so strict on their rations, on how much people can eat. Everyone, no matter who you are, no matter if you're the Mockingjay, no matter if you're from District 12, District 13, whoever you are, you have to do these chores. You have to stick to your schedule. You cannot fall out of line. It is basically like a military society and it has had to be that in order to survive underground, essentially, even though like they once had a plague and all this other stuff happened. District 13 is basically the place for Gale. It is cold. It is harsh. It is unforgiving. Katniss agrees to be the Mockingjay if they agree to give immunity to the other tributes who are currently being held prisoner in the capital. This is a huge thing. They don't want to give immunity. They are very much black and white in how they follow the letter of the law. President Coyne also sucks more in the book. She is less trustworthy and sympathetic from the get-go. District 13 and the harshness. Everyone from District 12 who has come there is like, what the fuck is this place? Like, this place sucks. Like, yes, we were alive. Yes, we were starving in District 12, but at least we could, like, go outside and drink beer and do shit. We can't do shit here. So it is a very, very harsh adjustment for even the people of District 12 and anybody that they brought over from the Capitol. We obviously see it become more so like this in the movies. We see President Coyne suck more and more, but all of this is a lot more apparent from the beginning. Finally, I want to talk about the prep team and Effie Trinket. The prep team and the performance of the Capitol are way more important in the books. I love, I love, I love, I love, I love what the movie did with Cinna. Having Lenny Kravitz play Cinna was one of the best casting decisions that they made. However, Katniss has a whole prep team, people who do her hair, people who do her makeup that she also gets close with. In the movies, they sort of combined elements of her prep team with Effie Trinket. Effie Trinket is a way less important character in the books and she doesn't even come to District 13. It's actually Katniss's prep team that comes to District 13. The prep teams are a very interesting middle ground because they are still capital, born and bred. Katniss doesn't even see her prep team as human. She sees them more as exotic birds. That's why when she's naked and being scrubbed and plucked in front of them, she doesn't even feel embarrassed or nervous. Even after she survives the first Hunger Games and goes on tour and they're doing her prep, they make it all about them. They're like, oh my God, it was so scary when this happened. I remember I was doing this. I was doing this. They sort of look at Katniss as this mascot, even though they love her. They are on her team. But I think it ultimately shows just how desensitized you become to the suffering in the capital. Ultimately, they're unable to see Katniss for how she is and who she is. Ultimately, like the prep teams become extensions of the tribute. Peta's prep team is executed. Katniss's prep team would have been executed if they hadn't also been taken to District 
13. That is it for my book to movies Hunger Games review. I don't think Katniss was as tough as she was traumatized, although I do think Jennifer Lawrence did a fantastic job playing her. I loved getting to know the world in the books. If you notice any other differences, I missed drop them below. I know there are some, but I just didn't want to take too long in this video, so maybe I'll make a part two. If you like this video, if you like my other videos, make sure you subscribe to my channel as I'll be coming up with a lot more videos soon, hopefully some more Hunger Games really if you want to see more Hunger Games related content, drop me a comment because I listen and I read my comments and your support means the world to me. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I will see you next time. Bye.